Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, I have just started the recording of today's presentation, Evaluation and Improvement of Crack Width Calculation Methods for Large-Scale Concrete Structures. Uh, those of you who are participating and listening in on this presentation, you will not be in the video unless you will ask questions at the end. And I will ask every one of you to mute uh, your microphones so that you will not interfere with the presentation. So then, Reynard, I will give the word to you. Yes, thank you, Shashti, for the introduction. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Reynard Tan, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Structural Engineering at NTNU in Trondheim, Norway. The title of my presentation today is Evaluation and Improvement of Crack Width Calculation Methods for Large-Scale Concrete Structures, which also is the working title of my PhD project. I've uh, been doing my PhD now for uh, two and a half years, so I'm in my last year now with the uh, aim of trying to submit the thesis within the end of the year. So shortly about the research team that is uh, related to uh, to the relevance of crack widths. Uh, the first uh, work package here is 711, which has the title Relevance of Crack Width and Decompression Requirements Due to Durability Aspects of Conventional Reinforcement. The, the topic uh, and the theme is led by researcher Tobias Danir, which is supported by Mette Geikir, Alexander Michel, and Carla Hornbostil. The second work package related to crack widths is the PhD project which I'm carrying, and where I'm supported by my uh, supervisors, uh, Tarja Kansta, Max Hendricks, Mette Geikir, and Dan Evert Becke. So the outline of this presentation is that we first introduce the objectives and then we um, introduce uh, what the problem related to calculating crack widths in large scale concrete structure is. And uh, then we show you how we will try to uh, solve the problem uh, and the research team. And then we will show you the main findings of the papers that are to form the uh, uh, thesis uh, of my PhD. And in the end here, we'll try to summarize and conclude the findings so far. So the main objectives of this PhD project is as what the title of my work project states, which is to evaluate and to improve crack width calculation methods for large scale concrete structures. Now notice that I've highlighted two keywords here in red, which is the crack width and the large scale concrete structures. Um, I will explain more and elucidate what I mean by these two words in the coming slides. The second objective is to provide more correct and economical design methods for large-scale concrete structures in the serviceability limit state. The experience feedback from uh, current design methods today is that the crack width calculation methods tends to yield more reinforcement amount in the serviceability limit state compared to, for example, the ultimate limit state. And this in particular for large-scale concrete structures. How realistic this is, however, is actually not clear and might lead to substantially higher economical costs in the design stage than what is possibly uh, necessary. First, what is a crack width? Well, concrete cracks when subjected to sufficiently large tensile forces. So if we have a concrete bar here that is subjected to pure tension, then it will crack somewhere along the bar. Uh, note, since there's no reinforcement here, most likely there will only be one crack. The measurement of the crack is then the crack width. If we now put in reinforcement in this plane bar, 
we will be able to distribute this single form crack to several cracks along the bar length with each crack having its own crack width and a crack distance between them. Now, what are the consequences of crack widths? Well, if we follow the design codes today, they are simply uh, the following. They reduce the uh, aesthetic uh, of a structure and are simply not pretty to look at. They also affect the performance of a structure uh, and may even cause leaking in structures. And also, they um, may affect the um, service life of a structure because it's seen that um, crack widths may induce corrosion in reinforced concrete structures. And last but not the least, uh, cracks affect the um, stiffness of a structure and also then the uh, deformations of the structure. Due to these consequences, the crack width is normally limited in the uh, magnitude of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 millimeters if we follow the current design codes today. Now, what do we mean by a large-scale concrete structure? A typical normal cross-section, uh, which is seen here in the figure, in the bottom figure, uh, in the bottom left here, is uh, a typical cross-section that has dimensions of maybe 0 0.2 times 0 0.4 meters, and where you then have a single layer of reinforcement. Uh, this can be typically used in buildings or parking garages or etc. However, when we're talking about large-scale concrete structures, we're talking about cross-sections that may be several meters in height. Uh, like, for instance, this box girder bridge or this box girder cross-section, uh, where you even may have several reinforcement uh, in several layers in all of the structural components of the cross-section. Note that also the um, reinforcement bars are substantially larger than what is used in normal cross-sections. Another example is a thick slab or a thick wall, for example. We even may have several layers of bundled reinforcement. So that's what we mean by large-scale concrete structures. Everything is much bigger than what is normally uh, used in typical cross-sections for reinforced concrete structures. Now, what are typical large-scale concrete structures at the Ferry Fee E39? Uh, one example is, is a uh, concrete cantilever bridge, uh, where the cross-section typically is a box girder, as shown in the previous slide, and can be up to possibly 10 to 15 meters in height at the maximum at, uh, for example, the columns. Another example is actually one of the conceptual studies that is being uh, conducted now for one of the fjord crossings at the Ferry Free E39, uh, which involves a two-span suspension bridge that's up to two kilometers each long, and where there's a, um, a um, suspension tower in the middle of the fjord that is founded on a gravity-based structure of concrete here. The gravity-based structure of concrete is actually uh, approximated to be around 400 um, uh, meters in height. And the total uh, height of with the uh, suspension tower is actually expected to be around 850 meters. So we're talking about really large dimensions here. A typical uh, dimension of the shafts in this gravity base structure is then approximately maybe around two to four meters thick. So what is actually the problem here? What are we trying to solve? Uh, well, the crack width formulas, which are in the Eurocode 2 and the FIB Molko 2010, in which we use in design of uh, most reinforced concrete structures, 
Uh, these formulas are based on the behavior of a typical normal cross-section. And the question is, is it then okay to use these in these large dimensions we are planning to use it in? And also is the first part of my PhD project, which then is the evaluation. And if not, what can we use? Uh, which is then the improvement part uh, and the second part of my project. So how we try or how we will intend to uh, solve this problem is by uh, showing us, showing you the uh, research scheme of this PhD project where uh, we first have evaluated um, the current calculation methods and which also pretty much sums up the state of the art of crack width calculations. Um, findings in these or in this uh, work led to paper one here, which had the uh, main conclusions that uh, we needed an improvement for, or typically for large scale concrete structures. Um, the first way of improving this uh, is by increasing the understanding of the cracking behavior of reinforced concrete ties, which also was the topic of paper two here. Um, the main findings in this paper led to the main assumptions in the new improved crack width calculation model for uniaxial stress states. And when we're talking about uniaxial stress states, we're meaning moment and actual forces that work in combination with each other, possibly in several directions. So this is the topic of paper three, but also we need a... Um, crack width calculation model for biaxial stress states where you may have the combined effect of moment, actual, and shear forces acting at the same time in several directions, which also is a typical stress state that is to be found in shell structures that are used in, for example, gravity based structures, which is then the topic of paper four here. Now I will go through the main findings in the different papers, starting with paper one, which had the title Experimental and Theoretical Investigation of Crack Width Calculation Methods for Reinforced Concrete Structures, or TIES, sorry. The main objectives were to investigate the theoretical background of the current crack width formulas in accordance to the Eurocode 2, the FIB Molecule 2010, and the German Annex. We included the German Annex because, in contrary to the Eurocode 2 and the FIB Molecule 2010, they exclude the cover term in calculating the maximum crack distance. We also investigated the modeling uncertainty of the formulas, meaning that we wanted to see how the formulas actually worked in practice. And finally, we wanted to assess the formulas in the purpose of generic use. The methods in obtaining these objectives were to conduct a thorough literature review and to conduct physical experiments on reinforced concrete ties. So before we start uh, showing how the formulas are presented in the uh, current design codes, we need to first understand the uh, reinforced concrete tie behavior. So consider that we have a bar here that is reinforced with a steel bar that is has ribs and then we pull in the reinforcement then a typical deformation configuration will look something like, like this. What we notice here is that we have internal cracks that have formed and this is due to the rib interaction between concrete and steel. Now using and taking the competition uh, equilibrium and compatibility at an arbitrary section within within this bar length, we finally obtain a second order differential equation for the slip. By solving this equation, we finally obtain the crack width and the crack distance. Now, the same empirical formulation according to the design codes use the exact same formulation and the same derivations that leads to the second order differential equation for the slip. 
However, they do not explicitly solve this equation, but do some simplifications claiming that this behavior can be simplified to this behavior. And then by setting up the computability and the equilibrium for this bar, we finally obtain the designated crack width formula that is dependent of a crack distance and the strain difference of steel and concrete along this distance. Now, it can be shown that the Eurocode 2 and the FIB MOCO 2010 and the German NX have adopted this concept. However, the simplification of not explicitly solving this differential equation leads to an inconsistent formulation, whereas the um, basic principles in statics are opposed. Uh, an example of that is that the um, equilibrium in calculating the maximum crack distance for example, is violated. And which from a structural engineering point of view is really not convincing at all. So you can ask yourself, how is this possible? How have a set of formulas that are not mechanically correct and opposes the basic principles in what structural engineers believe in, uh, how can they be implemented in the design codes we use today in designing reinforced concrete structures? Well, I think it's uh, related to the fact that they were formulated during a period, typically 1960 and 1970s, where serviceability limited design was not that important as it is today. And then instead of improving the mechanics in the formulas, they empirically adjusted the formulas instead. So to actually see how the uh, formulas work in practice, we did an experimental study of four reinforced concrete ties, uh, where the uh, dimensions of the cross-section was 400 by 400, and where the bar diameter uh, either was 20 millimeters or 32 millimeters, and the cover was either 90 millimeters or uh, 40 millimeters. The RC ties were pulled in pure tension and uh, they had a total length of actually three meters here, but only an effective length of two meters were used to uh, measure the uh, crack pattern. So to show you how the formulas actually work in practice and how well they uh, predict the crack widths in reality, we use the concept of modeling uncertainty, which is theta uh, is equal to uh, W095 here, which is the 95% quantile of the measured crack widths, and it's then the upper bound of the uh, measured crack widths, and divided by the uh, crack width predicted by the respective codes. Now, using the 95% quantile uh, or the upper bound of the measured crack widths, this in practice means that we're actually using the maximum crack widths that are observed to occur at the RC ties, and which probably occurs just once or twice out of maybe 100 observations. So the maximum crack widths that we are measuring from the RC ties. Now, if this uh, fraction here is equal to 1, then all of these dots would have been aligned along this straight line. However, as we see here, that for Eurocode 2, they actually predict crack widths that in average are 50% larger than the maximum crack widths observed in the experiments, meaning that the Eurocode 2 is overly conservative. The MALCO 2010 predicts the crack widths better, uh, however, occasionally to the unconservative side here, which are the dots that are marked on the upper side of this straight black line. German NX predicts crack widths that in average are unconservative and which is not convincing. The main message and the main conclusion here, however, is that the formula struggles in predicting crack widths for large bar diameters and large covers. So how can we improve the formulas? Well, my simple opinion on this is that we avoid the simplifications but directly solve this second-order differential equation for the slip. This would 
lead us to simulating the behavior of our reinforced concrete ties more consistently. And we're also able to account for large bar diameters and large co covers more consistently. At the end here, I also want to mention that it's better suited for including the effect of imposed deformations, which also is a very important load case, especially in calculating crack widths. So to summarize and conclude the uh, main findings of this paper, the semi-empirical formulas are based on simplifications that leads to a mechanically inconsistent formulation. And in practice, the Eurocode 2 averagely overestimates crack widths with 50%. This may require unnecessary high reinforcement amounts. The MULCO 2010 and the German annex predicts the crack widths better, but two unconservative side for large bar diameters and covers and are thus inconsistent in that formulation. Uh, the formulas are very much dependent on empirical adjustments, meaning that there's a limited range of applicability of the formulas and care should be taken when used in design of large-scale concrete structures. So the evaluation suggests that we indeed need an improved calculation model, which leads us to paper two here and has the uh, following title, an investigation of the cracking behavior of reinforced concrete ties using nonlinear finite element analysis. The objectives were to better understand the cracking behavior of reinforced concrete ties and to better understand the role of bar diameter and cover, which we saw uh, gave problems for the design codes in predicting crack widths, and to suggest a proper bond slip model that can be used in solving differential equation one. Now, as we just recall from this differential equation here, we see that and which I have marked with red here, we see that this differential equation is dependent of a bond slip model, and we simply need a relationship for, for this model in order for uh, this equation to be solved. The methods in obtaining uh, these objectives was to conduct virtual experiments on reinforced concrete ties using nonlinear finite element analysis. So the finite element model is based on a 3D analysis of reinforced concrete ties using the concept of axisymmetric elements. So if we now have our 3D bar here that is cylindrical and that is reinforced with a uh, steel bar in the middle of the cross section. So instead of actually modeling the whole bar here, we're using the concept of axisymmetry and, and instead modeling the axisymmetric plane. By doing that, we're able to uh, model the 3D model as a 2D model instead, but still accounting for the 3D stresses. So uh, due to axisymmetry, the following uh, finite element model can look something like this, uh, where you have um, symmetric uh, boundary conditions and you have the loading in the end here at the steel, and the steel is uh, here, and the concrete is the upper part here. Also, an interface layer was laid between concrete and steel, and I will explain now in the following slide why we did that. So, uh, the main assumptions in this finite element model is that we base them on the behavior that is observed from the experiments conducted on such uh, concrete elements. Well, we saw as earlier that due to the rib interaction between concrete and steel, internal cracks form, and the concrete at the steel concrete interface follows the displacement field of steel almost completely, which means that the crack width at the steel interface level is much smaller than the crack width at the concrete surface. Now, in our analysis, we neglect the uh, crack width at the steel interface, claiming that the concrete is assumed to follow the displacement field of steel completely. So this can be seen by that the sharing concrete nodes and steel nodes have the same displacements. And in addition, we used uh, nonlinear uh, material law for the concrete 
so it also was able to crack internally, uh, similar to what has been seen in these experiments. A total strain formulation was used for the material model. So to show you if our model is uh, predicting the behavior of RC ties correctly, we compared it with experiments. And we saw that we had good agreement in comparison of steel strains, crack widths, and also crack distances. So the model were able to, to simulate uh, all of these pretty well. And we can show you from a comparison of one of the experiments, which was from Bressler and Bertero, where they measured the steel strains at four different load levels. And we see here that the, uh, there's a relatively good agreement between the experimental steel strains and the steel strains obtained from the nonlinear finite element analysis <laughs> at all four different load levels. We also compared the crack widths with the experiments conducted by Yunupoulos in 1989, and we saw that also the development of the crack widths with the steel stresses uh, is, um, and the comparison of these are uh, also good. So we know now that the uh, finite element model works well and it's able to represent the physical behavior of what is observed in reinforced concrete ties. So now we wanted to conduct our own virtual experiments on, on, on RC ties. And the main objective was actually to investigate the influence of cover and bar diameter and how this affects a crack pattern. Now, uh, uh, we know that cover and bar diameter was something the, uh, the design code struggled, um, or something that the design codes uh, struggled when they predicted crack widths. And uh, we also know that we have large covers that are intended to be used in, in, in these types of structures. So if you follow the Norwegian Public Roads Administration guideline N400 uh, for designing bridge structures today, they would require up to 120 millimeters covers uh, in their structures that are exposed to marine environment. And just to give you a comparison, the cover that um, normally is covered by the design codes today has covers up to approximately 40 to 60 millimeters, which is a typical normal design. So we're talking about covers that are doubled and even uh, three times as large as what is normally used. And also we know that large bar diameters often occur in large scale concrete structures, which we showed you in, in the previous slides for uh, the large cross sections. So we did virtual experiments on four different RC ties here where the primary variables were as uh, earlier, uh, either the cover, which was 40 millimeters or 90 millimeters, or the bar diameter, which either was 20 millimeters or 32 millimeters. Now, what we see is that the influence of cover is that the cover governs the crack distance. And larger cover leads to larger crack distance. So. Nothing new about this, nothing revolutionary. This has been seen in experiments and is also known by most common engineers. Uh, however, what we saw was that the cover does not explicitly influence the crack width, but affects it implicitly by increasing the crack distance. Now I will explain what I mean by this sentence. So if we now have two um, RC ties here again that have the similar length, similar, similar bar diameter, but different covers. If we now expose these two RC ties to the same loading, they will be, they will exhibit or they will be observed to exhibit the same deformations and the same crack widths. So meaning that the cover does not explicitly influence the crack width. However, we know that this RC tie or the member length of this RC tie is not realistic because we know that larger cover would lead to larger crack distances. So a more reasonable 
uh, uh, member length or crack distance for this um, specimen having a larger cover would ha also have a larger crack distance or a larger member length. Now, exposing this member here to the same amount of loading shows that the crack width is larger, meaning that it implicitly affects the crack width by increasing the crack distance. The influence of bar diameter is actually that it does not influence the crack width. So if we have similar cover but different bar diameters, this, sorry, um, it does not influence the crack distance. Um, that's the main message here and not the crack width. So a similar cover but different bar diameter would result in the same similar crack distance. And this can be uh, proved by the uh, by looking to the bond stress distribution of the RC ties here, where we see that we have now compared the bond distributions uh, for two RC ties having the same cover but different bar diameters. Uh, and what we see here is that the bond stress distribution is pretty much affected by the bar diameter. However, the point at which the bond stresses become negligible, approximately under one megapascal, is at the same location over the bar length, meaning that although the bond stress distributions are uh, not similar, the crack distance or the distance where a crack occur occurs at the same place over the bar length. So what is observed is that the crack distance uh, governs, um, sorry, the crack distance is governed by the size of the cover and not the bar diameter. And finally, uh, the one of the most uh, important findings in this paper is that we only need one local bond slip curve, which it can be used in accordance to Molko 2010. Uh, that can be used in solving differential equation one, however, with adjusted parameters. So here we have the different local bond slip curves uh, for all of the uh, investigated specimens at different locations over the bar length. And we see here that we can use one local bond slip curve in, uh, for the average response of all of these uh, RC ties. I won't go into what a local bond slip curve actually uh, means here, but it says something of a, how the uh, bond stress uh, transfer or how the bond transfer is affected uh, by the amount of internal cracking in the specimens. So to summarize and conclude here, the cover and not the bar diameter governs the crack distance. Larger cover leads to larger crack distances and thus larger crack widths. And the local bond slip curve in accordance to FIBMOLCO 2010 can be used in solving differential equation one. Which leads us to paper three here, which has the title an improved analytical crack width calculation model for uni actual stress dates. The main objectives were to formulate a new calculation model that better predicts crack widths than the current models in the Eurocode 2 and the FIB model 2010 and to formulate a solution method for differential equation one that is practical applicable. The methods in obtaining these objectives were to use the findings in paper two to derive the new calculation model and to analytically solve differential equation one using Newton's binomial theorem. So the main assumptions in this new model is that steel and concrete are treated as elastic materials and that all nonlinearity related to bond is lumped to the interface between concrete and steel by using a local bond slip model. So if we now have our uh, cracked uh, section here again internally due to the rib interaction between concrete and steel, then we say that this section can be modeled with something uh, similar to this section where we now have replaced the uh, effect of internal cracking with some spring behavior and since we now have a material law for the spring behavior which was obtained uh, from the previous paper 
we can now model this behavior with something like this instead. So setting up the equilibrium for this section now would lead us uh, setting up the equilibrium, the compatibility, and using the bond slip law from paper two yields finally the second order differential equation for the slip, which now uh, can be solved. And by solving this, we finally obtain the crack distance and the crack width. The question though is how do we actually solve this differential equation? This is a nonlinear second order differential equation and a solution is not straightforward. But we formulated a um, solution method that uh, is able to solve this by using something called the Newton's binomial theorem. And then we obtain two different uh, solutions, one in the crack formation stage, which is in a closed form, and one in the stabilized cracking stage, which is not in a closed form. And the constants in the stabilized cracking stage must be solved iteratively due to varying boundary conditions. Uh, however, we've implemented a solution method uh, that involves uh, using the newton raphson iterations and making this a practical, applicable uh, solution that can be used uh, for design purposes. So the preliminary results and conclusions from this paper shows that the solution method yields a practical applicable analytical calculation model. The analytical calculation model is capable of replicating the nonlinear finite element analysis conducted in paper two, simply meaning that we have an analytical model that does the same job as a nonlinear finite element analysis would have done. The new model is more consistent than Eurocode 2 and FIB Molko 2010, regardless of the cover size and bar diameter. And this yields finally a more correct and economical design of large scale concrete structures in the serviceability limit state. <clears throat> uh, finally, paper four here, which has the title um, Analytical Crack Width Calculation Model for Biaxial Stress States, which means that we now, uh, for example, have an orthogonal reinforcement net to reinforcement directions, and where you have stresses in two directions and also shear stresses. Uh, this will be the next paper we will be starting at, and um, which we will finish by uh, the end of this year. So the preliminary conclusions from this uh, findings is that paper one uh, suggests that we need an improved crack width calculation model that is more consistent in the design of large-scale concrete structures, especially when using uh, large bar diameters and covers. Paper two suggests that we need a bond slip law, um, or that we can use the bond slip law according to FIB molecule 2010 in solving the differential equation for the slip. And paper three yields an improved calculation model for you in the actual stress states. Uh, paper four will yield an improved calculation model for biaxial stress states. Finally, I would just like to acknowledge the uh, Ferry Free E39 and the Norwegian Public Roads Administration for financing this PhD project. And also I want to acknowledge the contributions from supervisors and colleagues at NTNU and Community Concert. Yes, that was all I had, Shashti. We're now open for any questions, uh, if you would like to ask them orally, or if you would like to ask them uh, in writing, you can do either way. Uh, we have one question from the audience here. Uh, at the multi-consult, is that okay, Shashti? That is quite okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, hello, it's Don Evert Becke. Uh, 
a nice uh, presentation here. Very, very good. Uh, I wonder about one little thing. You said that the body of meta doesn't influence, and you didn't. And but as we, as an engineer, know that very often we just say that if we reduce the space and put in uh, smaller reinforcement, mm. we will have a bigger, much bigger surface between the concrete and the reinforcement. So I can I can just can you explain what you mean by uh, by that state? Uh, yes, uh, I know that's a bit controversial uh, with respect to what we actually know from before. But uh, the border meter uh, it is what is seen from these virtual experiments is that. Um, independent of your bar diameter, the crack distance will be the same. So that the bar diameter will only transfer the force to the concrete, but the same, they need the same amount of length independent of how large the bar diameter is to induce cracking. So that uh, it, it's simply the spreading of the force over the cover that governs uh, the uh, final crack distance. So that, um, and that was, that's what I mean, but by, by that the cover is governing for the crack distance and not the bar diameter, because the bar diameter is only there to transfer the, the uh, force to the concrete, but independent of how large the bar diameter is, they would still need the same transfer length in order to transfer that force that leads to a cracking force. So if you have the same postal area on the board meter, mm. and you reduce the body amount, you have to have many more reinforcement bars in that meter, you say that the crack distance will be the same. Mm. Yes, and one thing why this is actually proven, or why we can prove this, is that in the codes we're using today, when we calculate the uh, the uh, maximum crack distance, we assume that the bond stress is always constant, independent of the bar diameter, right? What we see here in in these um, in these graphs here is that the mean bond stress is not constant and that it varies depending on your bar diameter. So the assumption of claiming that that bond stress or that mean bond stress always is constant uh, regardless of your bar diameter is not correct um, compared to what we see from these virtual experiments which also has been verified in the literature. So Regardless, and you can also see this from experimental results in the literature, that if you have different bar diameters, but the same cover, they would still result in the same crack distances. So it's good news for large structures now. Yes, most likely, yeah. They, you, you, you will almost have a constant uh, crack distance because, or, or if you use the same cover. So, and just to uh, specify here, the reason why you, uh, and that's why they then add this cover term, because they see that this, this mechanical term does not result in a, a typical crack distance as what is seen in experiments. And this is, I think, related to the fact that they use a constant mean bond stress regardless of the bar diameter. Okay, I have a question for you, Renard. Yes. Um, you talked about in your first paper uh, mm -hmm. that the Eurocode um, 
uh, did not show the right uh, results. And you talked about how we use the N400 in Norway. Yes. With the cover. Mm -hmm. um, have you found in your research anything that could help us in the Norwegian Public Roads Administration save money on the bridges that we're going to build? Yes, that's a good question, uh, Shashti. Uh, and uh, as I as I pinpointed out in um, in paper one here, if we look to the modeling uncertainty of the formulas here, so that if you have the Eurocode two here, we said that the Eurocode two predicted crack widths that were fifty percent larger than what is uh, observed, and then Note that we're talking about 50% larger than the maximum crack widths observed in the experiments that possibly occur once or twice out of 100 observations. And in the Norwegian Public Roads Administration, we have to use covers that are up to 120 millimeters uh, for structures or bridge structures that are exposed to marine environment. Uh, the formulas we then would use to satisfy the crack width limits in these large covers would lead to much higher reinforcement amounts than what is actually necessary compared to what we would have seen in real experiments. And that is because the formulas are formulated in a way that the mechanics are violated and are inconsistent and does not really, really account for the true behavior of reinforced concrete ties. And that's why also what's been happening is that they've been uh, empirically adjusted instead of actually improving the, uh, uh, the mechanics behind the formulas. But the new set of formulas uh, we're working on should be able to calculate or at least predict crack weights that are more consistent regardless of the cover size and the barter meter. So meaning if you have a large cover, uh, you would at least get a more uh, precise prediction of, of the crack width, meaning that you also would reduce the total amount of reinforcement than you would have done if you used the Eurocode 2. I'm very glad to hear that. That's good. So, do we have any other questions? Yes, one more from the audience here, Shashti. Yes, could you please ask them to come up to the microphone so we can hear the question? Yes. Uh, yes, again, uh, so what we have uh, seen by the different formulas uh, um, during the years is that it's uh, as you say. It's it's kind of two two models. One one concrete part, and I am I mean one cover part. Yes. And one bond part. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also explained to us that um, uh, in the Eurocode and in the German uh, annex, annex, they didn't take include the cover at all. Um, while in uh, in Euro code Norwegian annex, uh, it's doubled compared to the old Norwegian code. Mm. Uh, and do I understand you right if, when you said that the cover part has an influence uh, while the bond... Uh, so in a way, what you say that the German annex uh, uh, takes some uh, wrong when it comes to the cover and you had seen that in your, in, in your uh, example also, hadn't you? So could you just explain, is that correct, that yes, in a way, both parts um, includes, so uh, during the years, they have in a way mixed and seen that they did never get the results correct, so they have used the cover part to, to try to, uh, to, to, to fix it uh, correctly. Uh, and But it, with your model, you will see that both the bond part and the, uh, and the cover part uh, um, will be there. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That was the first question. And then the second was, could you say something about uh, which 
track width we should calculate and uh, and uh, uh, because I think that is it that they have face oh. or uh, by the reinforcement because uh, mm. we know that there has been a discussion about uh, about what which crack width is is there any danger related to uh, I can't say anything about uh, which crack width that is is uh, relevant with respect to durability uh, and that is something that's being investigated in the other uh, part of this project and the other research or work package. So I can't say if it's the surface crack or the crack at the reinforcement that's uh, dangerous with respect to uh, durability. But what I can say is that uh, the crack width at the steel surface will be very, very much smaller than that at the concrete surface. Uh, and in, in our calculation models and not so that we don't misunderstand. The crack widths we calculate are at the concrete surface and not at the steel bar surface. So not to misunderstand here, it's nothing, it's, it's simply the physical crack widths that we observe in the structures. And the, first question. the first question was that, yes, you're indeed right, uh, Don Emmert, that, um, there's very much confusion related to uh, which part of the maximum crack distance formula that is governing. Some say it's the bond part, some say it's the cover part, and it's just a huge misunderstanding there, I would say. It's simply be related because I don't think the mechanics is pure enough, and that's why it mixes up. So some say they believe in the bond part more, some say they believe in the cover part more because they've seen it in experiments. But what I say, yes, in my formulas, we don't distinguish between the cover part and the bar diameter part anymore. It's all in the mechanics, equilibrium is not violated and the compatibility is there. So we only have one formula for calculating the maximum crack distance and not consisting of several parts. Yes, Shati. Okay. Do we have any other questions? If not, I will use the opportunity to remind you all that we have uh, another presentation tomorrow. Uh, Sabina will talk about uh, the deterioration of uh, uh, concrete in subsea tunnels with biofilm. And that is also very interesting for you, those of you who are interested in, uh, in the concrete part of this project. So that will happen tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Yes. I think then if we have no more questions, I don't see anyone writing and I don't see any hands. Then I would say thank you for a very great presentation, Reynard. Uh, it was good to know that we are still doing our best and uh, all the good things that you are developing, you will let us know more about it later. Yes. So thank you. And then I will stop the recording for now. Thank you.